You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. This is Doug, and you're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense. We're going to dive in today and talk a little bit about uh, service-type businesses, those who are more relying on laborers to get the frontline work done. And my guest is a guy named Clifton Savage. He comes from that kind of background and has developed an interesting twist and spin on helping leaders do more with what they've got. Clifton, welcome to the show. Thank you, Doug. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, give everybody a, a quick backstory on on your journey and and how you kind of got focused on on this idea of uh, working with a labor oriented workforce. Yeah, well, you know, I got my start being in the labor oriented workforce, being you know an employee on the front lines uh, straight out of high school. Um, had some fortunate opportunities uh, getting into manufacturing early on in life. Uh, but I've been heavily involved in, you know, the contractor space as well, electrical contractors, painters, plumbers, uh, roofers, uh, family and friends that I've known. And so uh, while my career started on the front lines, I quickly rose up to middle management and um, I quickly found that I was kind of the mediator between upper management and the front lines um, and seeing the gaps of uh, taking care of the front lines so they can do their job properly. So they have the training, so they have the um, the trust and the, you know, loyalty to the upper management by getting that support from upper management. And so, um, as I continue to see that, as I can continue to sharpen my skills, uh, in the corporate world, uh, move up into companies and even supervise a manufacturing plant. Um, I quickly transitioned to, you know what, um, I need to go into business for myself. I need to help people from my angle with my ways and my tools, uh, for those that really want it to, um, and it may have a little bit more flexibility. And, you know, so we kind of focus on the uh, smaller businesses, small to medium size, you know, five to 50 employees, uh, five to 15 million type thing, uh, types of companies. Um, and then, yeah, we just take it off from there. How do you uh, dig a little deeper into your profile of companies you work with? Are, are there any particular niches or or industry segments you're working on? Yeah, well, you know, as as when you start your own business, you just got to start with what you got, right? And it's building off the contacts you've had in the past and people in your local community. Um, and so, fortunately for me, I got a good start and you know got a good support group around me that took off pretty quickly. But I found that because of the people that took a shot on me uh, and the work that we've done and the, you know, satisfaction that we've brought, um, you know, a lot of word of mouth has spread, especially in the roofing industry. Um, and so that's some, where some of my biggest uh, referrals have come from is in the roofing space. And so, um, one, myself and my team, as we continue to grow and hone our skills, uh, you know, and really envelop ourselves in that industry, you know, we understand the dynamics and the struggles that they're dealing with. Um, there's a broad struggle that we're all dealing with, right? When it comes to labor, uh, you know, staffing and things like that. But we're getting really niche down right now with the commercial space, uh, commercial roofing space, um, because we're just building on the successes we've had in the past. And that's, you know, provides a vote of confidence to people that are asking, hey, can you help us? And we can say yes with confidence. Yeah, <clears throat> that, that, that does make good sense. And let's let's um, let's let's kind of lean in. I want I want to come at it from the leadership standpoint. So uh, thinking about these company owners that are calling on you for help, is there a, a common theme you see when you first start working with a new company? Um, common themes. Yes. I mean, you know, a lot of the companies we've come into, there's a transition period happening, right? And we already know there is one with the, the generational shifts, the changes in technology, um, the changes in the economy, you know, all that stuff is pressuring people to adapt or die. Um, and so with that, those that are into, you know, even post COVID with the rise of remote work and remote networking, you know, with, with Facebook groups and, uh, you know, uh, communities online, not that they're new, but they're just, they've grown, right. Is a lot of the trends that I've seen and the, the themes of those owners and leaders coming to me for help is that they're trying to be more profitable. 
They're trying to be more sustainable. They're trying to stop fight fires and, and really be able to delegate and stop micromanaging too. Um, and a lot of them are the visionaries. So they have that idea, but they have no clue how to implement and sustain, you know, everybody's motivation to follow through on the plans that they've come up with. So yeah, that's, that's where we found a good, um, you know, niche is helping those visionaries and really execute on their plans as they try and transform their business and evolve to the next level. You know, one of the challenges that uh, the entrepreneur world has in general is that uh, the, the typical person that decides to start a business isn't a business person. They, <laughs> they've, they've got a skill or they've got a trade or they've got an idea yep. and they, they build a business around it. And as soon as they hire their first person, now they've got to be a manager and ultimately they need to become a leader, but they don't always do well at being a manager, much less being a leader. So yeah. um, I, I see that a lot and, and helping those owners kind of make that transition. And, and you touched on something about micromanaging. The, the other plight that I, I see a lot of is, is owners who've developed these businesses get buried in the weeds. Yeah and they don't dig out from it. And there's, you know, popular phrase, most everybody knows it now, if you're in an entrepreneur circles, you need to be working on the business, not in the business. Yep. And that's much easier said than done, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's very tempting, right? To, to stay involved in everything. And, and like, you're, like you said, Doug, a lot of the, especially in the contractor space, from my experience, like my father, um, he worked for another company and then he said, I want to go off on my own so I can own my time, my money, my, my choices. Right. And there's a, it, there's a falling off point though, when it becomes, you know, you're bringing on your first employees, you're bringing on a team to scale. Um, and, and all of us need to have a team and systems to free up our time because it shouldn't be a, a badge of honor that you're, you know, burning the candle at both ends working you know, 80, you know, 90 plus hours a week. Um, you know, almost probably if you looked at the numbers making less than you did when you worked for somebody else. And so, yes, it's that avoiding the temptation to let go and to not have to do everything yourself and know that you can trust the people and the systems that you took time to set up and train and build properly that you can confidently walk away and know that the house isn't going to catch fire. Yeah. I think you and I share a lot of common focus focal points in the market and because I, I too am leading a team of people that it's trying to help owners create a leadership team inside their business so that things can be delegated, things can be authorized at, a, at another level, yep. and it won't be the owner answering the phone all day long or, or putting out the fires or dealing with service complaints and all of those things day by day. And if you can identify a, a bona fide leadership team and you know, it, it might only be two or three other people, but right. still it's, it's more of a team approach to running the business than the one guy wears all the hats. It's not that fun. I, I think, you know, doing it on your own, being the lone wolf, it, it has its moments. It might be exciting at first. It might be something that you're, you know, you can brag about, but that dies off very quickly because that's very hard to sustain. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, you know, we, we can see just from the pandemic and the quarantine and the isolation, how it affected everybody, you know, mentally, emotionally. And so the same thing with business owners though, too. And we've been running that journey for, you know, decades before the pandemic, but we're not meant to live in isolation. And so leaders need to build a team around them, even if the person is not on their payroll, right? They're not an employee, they're not a subcontractor, contractor, but they are someone that is an advisor or someone to lean on or learn from the owners that makes the journey so much more powerful um, for everybody. And, and so I hope more leaders understand that and know that they got to build their team, uh, even if they're only the one writing the checks. 
Well, I, th I think the other thing that happens in, in these uh, trade-based businesses is that um, sometimes it's just kind of really extreme, you know, tough, hot, un you know, difficult conditions to work in. And so that the owners don't always think about creating a culture for their company. Mm hmm they're just worried about the next job and the next contract, the next delivery. And um, it, it, it turns into a grind really fast, not just for the owner, but for the people that work there. Oh yeah. So uh, w what kind of things do you talk to owners about for maybe turning the tide and, and creating a bona fide culture where people are inspired and motivated to show up day after day? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I try and focus on when I'm working with the leaders and that's who I go to, right. That's my decision maker. That's the person that my point of contact, um, when I'm working to ultimately help the frontline people, but I'm working through upper management downwards. And the biggest thing that I emphasize, and it's, it's, you know, right there on our, our, our name and our mission statement, it's being a service first leader and leading by example. And so that means once you become the boss and you have a team, it's not that, oh, I get to tell people what to do. No, you have to go and ask people, what do they need from me? And that's what I do in my business. That's what I emphasize when everybody else's businesses that I help with um, is that the leader needs to go in and, and truly ask, well, what do you need from me? Right. What kind of training do you need? OK, sure. You got the experience. You got the background. You got the know how. But what do you need from me to what I like to call the three E's of an engaged employee building that culture? which is how can I enlighten you on your job, what you need to get accomplished and the opportunities that, you know, are there if you want to grow, if you want to, you know, perform at a higher level. Um, and then, you know, em empowering them by walking them through, okay, this is, you know, the training, this is the other opportunities you have. This is where you can grow uh, personally and professionally. And then equipping them with the right tools and the right systems, automating as much as you can so you're not handholding those you know, those employees with those tools and um, those systems. And, and from that, you're creating a, a personalized but professional process of building that culture naturally, not a forced upon, you know, facade of a, we have culture in this company. No, you are intentionally figuring out how to serve every single employee in the company. That's your culture. It's working the other way around. So, yeah, that's how I approach it. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. Sometimes people, if they're challenged to state their mission, purpose, and values, you know, they'll point to a poster on the wall in the break room and, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there's a coat rack in front of it. So it's like, well, <laughs> uh, who gets that on yeah. a regular basis? You know, it, it, it was done in a workshop maybe, you know, at the start of the year and nobody ever thinks about it after that. And, um, but it might be pasted all over the company's website and everybody's scratching their head going, really? Hmm? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I I told the story recently. There's one company I know of. Uh, they're a, a big uh, construction outfit over in Florida, and their mission, vision, and value statement is one simple word. We, we want to do the right thing. And... Uh, you know, people say, well, that's, you know, okay, yeah, that's good. That's convenient. But what you don't realize is, is the way the owner manifests that. I mean, he, he really makes it clear all the time, all day long. And you, you gotta, you gotta walk the talk as the word goes. And, and when you like, even when he's out on a job, runs into one of his guys, there's a little problem brewing. The, the question is always, well, what's the right thing to do here? Mm. Not, not what is the cheapest thing? Not what is the, you know, the, the quickest, you know, cut a corner, or do something. No, it's like, what's the right thing to do? And he's, somewhat proud of the fact, you know, he, he will eat costs if, if it's truly, you know, on them that something got done wrong <clears throat> and he doesn't try to capture it later in some other line item on the budget for the mm -hmm. project. He'll, he just, he's upfront with his customers. He says, you know, here's what we did. Here's what it cost us. And we're going to move on. And 
you know, people really love that. And he's got long tenured client retention. Yeah. That's not a surprise by any means. Yeah. You have to really live that culture if you're going to have it. Well, talk to us about the, uh, the, uh, sourcing and acquisition of, of talent and labor, because that's a, that's a hot topic as well in these trade oriented businesses. Yeah. So, um, so I've got a, a ebook that I put out and it's, it's called the attraction blueprint. Um, and it just, it can be found on my website, serviceleadersystems.com, but it breaks down the, um, my perspective, my experience and observation of the, the problems in the workforce, um, why, especially, you know, trades companies are struggling to find good talent. And to your point, Doug, what you were just saying about that other gentleman and how he does right, you know, by his clients, by his teams, even if it costs him, right, that is being proactive about putting a good word out there, getting ahead of, you know, any, any hiccups along the way. And every company needs to be doing that internally as well. Because at the end of the day, all employees are going to talk about their day, right? We spend eight hours or more at work Monday through Friday. The most of our time and our experiences are with our employer. But most companies are completely asleep at the wheel on being proactive about making that a good experience for their employees. Now, I'm not saying enabling you know, bad behavior, or enabling things and just being a, a, a doormat. But what I am saying is being proactive about what we talked about earlier, about how do you engage your employees? How do you take care of them? That shaping that construct is what's going to make it much easier for you to be able to go and attract talent, attack, attract qu high quality talent, because now you're not just trying to rush to fill a hole because you lost another guy because he was you know pissed off at you. And, you know, you're constantly having all these leaky holes of people leaving because uh, you don't have a good retention model. And that's going to that word is going to spread, whether it's online or whether it's local, you know, the word about your company is spreading, good or bad. So you need to be proactive about making it good, just like you would do with clients and getting good business, putting the word out there about clients. Everyone should be doing the same with their employees. But a lot of times either they're complacent because hey, had the same guys for 15, 20 years. We don't need to recruit. Um, or, Hey, you know what? This is an elephant in the room that I don't want to deal with. So let's just hope someone walks in the door and drops off application. We got to be proactive. We got to take care of the people that are there, enlighten, empower, equip them, and then share that. Once you've shaped it, now you can share this with confidence and it's going to naturally attract higher quality people. And we help with obviously building the systems in to help filter through and funnel through, um, the people, you know, just like you would with clients, but, uh, uh, we do right. that for the candidates on the recruiting side. Well, and to your point, you know, these guys on and ladies on the teams, they talk. And it's not just with their colleagues at work, but they often their their friends and relationships are with others in the same kind of trade. And so, you know, they might be at a barbecue or a, a little league ball game or something and they're talking. Yep. And when people outside the company hear people inside the company saying, I've got an awesome work experience. You wouldn't believe how my day goes. You know, it's hard work. Yes. But the owner cares. They take care of me. Here's three reasons why, blah, blah, blah. And these other people outside are going, gee, my boss doesn't do that for me. I, <laughs> I, you got any openings over at your place? You yeah. know, can I come over there? And it's that kind of word of mouth that really perpetuates the right kind of people wanting to join in and be part of it. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of a quick story. There's a, there's an owner I know that, it, and this was an acquisition to your point, a baby boomer sold off his business to a, a, a younger gentleman. And um, the, the new owner hired a person to drive what we called his people and culture initiatives. Yeah. And after they got some of the basic uh, administrative things shored up, also to your point, put in systems and programmed and better managed, this lady started uh, taking off several times a week with a with an ice chest in her truck and Gatorades, and she'd go out to the job sites. Nice. 
and pull up and just you know pass out the cold Gatorades and 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 chat with everybody, just engage for the moment. You know, how's it going? How you doing? Anything you know? Anything broken that we need to fix? You know, how what's going on? And you know, the teams love it. I mean, it's just a very small token, but it's yeah. it's expressing a sensitivity that they are making a valuable contribution to the business. We want to honor that and recognize that. So it's not a big fat bonus check that had to get paid. It's just a small token of appreciation. And the morale in the business already in just a few months has gone way up compared to where it started. And they've already started realizing that referral value that I talked about. Yes. You know, they've had a couple of inquiries from outside going, Hey, my friend George works for you. He's telling me great things about what you guys are doing. You know, you got any openings, anything I could do for you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And that's the, the, the sex, successful clients I've seen that have had a great recruiting period, uh, even though we systemized it, it was word of mouth referrals. We didn't have to put out a job ad. We didn't have to pay for a job ad, right? People walked in the door themselves because of other employees you know, both in the offices and out in the fields, spreading the word. It, it's it's a big difference, it, but it starts with small act, actions like you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, back to kind of shaping the mindset of the owner, any other thoughts on approaches or coaching or teaching that you do with owners to kind of get their head in the right space about how to, how to look at this? Uh, employee retention and attraction? Yeah. So, you know, the biggest thing I look at when I approach this, you know, my background was started in manufacturing um, and, and grew and evolved over time uh, into the contractor space, working, you know, in, in some of those companies as an employee, as a manager. Um, and, you know, one of the best lessons I learned though, from my early days was the Toyota production system and the concept of Kaizen, which is working together for each other's good. Um, and also the, what's called the lean principle. So if you think about it, you know, you can see a big, you know, bloated, lethargic person versus a very lean, agile, healthy person. That's what we want to make these businesses look like. And it starts with like what you said, the mindset. Um, and so that, that responsibility, you know, I, I lay on the owners, on the leadership that they need to understand how can we make these things more sustainable? How can we do more with less? Right. And so some of the systems I, I recommend to people and, and that we use uh, and stand by, they're not the most expensive. They're not the most flashy, but they get the job done. They work and they're they're simple enough that, you know, everyone can use it, learn it and, and maintain it after we leave. Right. That's our goal is not to just come in and coach. And then if someone leaves, that coaching has gone. No, we're installing the systems as we coach, as we install our principles um, and so when it comes to the, you know, attracting, training, retaining, I instill in everybody that I work with the lean principles and, and how Kaizen working together for each other's good, you know, needs to be seen across all those activities. It needs to be part of the end goals in mind when it comes to why do we want to attract more talent? Why do we want to invest in training programs? Why do we want to invest in, in the retention programs, the benefits and, and analyzing where we can get creative with taking care of our people. Um, and so I look at it as, well, how can we make the most with little and then have that positive change compound over time? Right. <clears throat> you know, I've, I've occasionally tried to think about from a owner leader's perspective and in their own time allocation, back to the concept of working on the business, not in the business, mm -hmm. Um, I would argue that the focus on people development and retention probably should be more like 30 to 40% of that owner's focus rather than just going out and getting new, closing new deals, getting new sales or, or buying materials or whatever the nuts and bolts of the business may be. Right. Because, um, showing up and letting people know that <clears throat> you got their back, you, you are there for the greater good. 
and you, you want them to be a part of that, I think is, is such a huge part. And it is the way these hardworking businesses can scale and grow. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I utilize the disc assessment heavily, both with leadership development, uh, team building, you know, when it comes to communication, but I also use it for the recruiting side of things. Um, but to your point, as a business owner, even myself, right, I've identified my strengths and I'm more strong in, you know, the service of people, the thinking through the plans and the structures and the logistics more than I am the marketing and the sales. And so to your point, Doug, I agree. The owner needs to be fully responsible for taking care of their people. Um, if they're stronger in sales or management, either they need to get someone to assist them with that because they still need to be part. They're still the face of the company, right? Even if their name's just on the check and the HR is signing it, but they're still a part of that and they have to own up to, this is not my strength, right? Uh, uh, planning things out or sitting down a little bit slower and working on the business rather than working in it. You know, sometimes we get the rush from being in the business, right? In the trenches, but right. we have yeah. to, as a leader, be high level to say, this is an area of weakness. I need someone to help me so I can accomplish this. Cause yeah, you're right. You owners can't excuse themselves for not spending time on the retention. It's their responsibility too. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what, Clifton, I think we're about up on time, man. This has been really helpful. You, you've kind of alluded to it, but uh, tell everybody again, your website and the name of your business. Yeah. So my website is the um, is service leader systems.com. And that's the name of the company. The DBA um, is Service Leader Systems. And, you know, you can find more information about the Attraction Blueprint, which is our ebook on the website, uh, as well as our main, you know, services, which is the Attraction System, which is where we come in and help, you know, install the custom-made systems and train you up on how to use it um, within three months, uh, you know, or you get a, a month free if we don't finish in time. Um, and then, of course, from there, you guys can find me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm engaging the most. Uh, Cliff Savage is my profile. And then of course you can find the same business name as, uh, on there as well. Well, that sounds great, man. And as always folks, we're going to have those links in the show notes. So, uh, hop down there and, uh, mash the buttons and you'll get over to his information. But, um, Cliff, thanks once again for sitting in and sharing with us. Sounds like great stuff you're doing and congratulations. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate the conversation. This has been great. All right. Well, with that, folks, we're going to sign off, say goodbye, uh, let you get out there and go make it a great day. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.